demons. We hear a lot about it these days, whether it's through songs like maybe the Alec Benjamin one you may be familiar with, or it could be Imagine Dragons and movies especially. For example, we're seeing an uptick in horror movies lately. Have you noticed? And a lot of these are demonic in nature. We see that in most of these stories and most of these movies, there's a disclaimer that says based on or inspired by true events. I'd venture to say we're becoming very desensitized to this whole idea of demons. But here's the bottom line. We're all affected by this. You know, I, I look at what Alec Benjamin said in the song. He says, I've got all those demons, all these demons hiding underneath. Nobody can see them, nobody but me. And you're the reason. The only thing that keeps me from diving off the deep end. Now, I'm not presuming that he's talking about God here. And I'm not presuming Jesus is who is keeping him from going over the cliffs, but probably a girl or a friend he likes. He had a reason for what he said, though. But there is a lot of truth in those words when you apply it, especially to Christ. When you apply it to God, when you apply it to the Holy One. Today, I'm not here to break down what is a demon. I'm not here to focus a lot on the nature of demons. That's not what this is for. In fact, it's the exact opposite. It's the answer to it. It's the very theme that Mark focuses on so much in this book, and that is the authority of Jesus. That's what I'm here to talk about today. The authority of Jesus in light of the reality of evil and the reality of demons, the reality that is angels even. There. That's what I'm here to encourage and equip you with today. The reality of the authority of Jesus and how you can have that same authority. Hi, my name is Josh Anders. I'm the worship pastor here at The Point, and it is an absolute honor to be able to be here and, and speak with you today and share with you from my heart of what God has been showing me in this fifth chapter of Mark. We must realize that, first of all, there's this overarching thought here today. I want you to decide between do you want peace in your life or do you want torment in your life? Peace or torment? That's the question I have for you today. Now, we can jump straight to the end, and I'm going to tell you right now, the end is Jesus is the answer, but let's really break this down. I think you would naturally want to choose peace, right? Like, uh, yeah, of course, who would want torment? But many of us choose torment in our everyday lives. We, we may not think of it as torment. It, it could be stress or anxiety. Sometimes a lot of bad decisions can end up and just seem just like torment. And then sometimes we can really, truly be in torment. And one day outside of this earth, we will have to choose before then, of course, do we want peace or torment? Because then we will be really facing eternal peace or eternal torment. So this is a very real question that I want to talk with you about today. What, what do you choose? And I want to tell you off the bat, the answer is this, that the authority and power over torment in your life, over any kind of torment, over demonic torment, over evil in this world, it's Jesus Christ. And the great news about that is, is if you're a believer in Christ, if you're a child of God, you have that same authority as well. It's true. Now, that should give you so much peace right off the bat, right off the bat. But in order to understand why it's important to have peace and to choose peace in our lives is because there is a spiritual world all around us. God is a supernatural God. He is spirit. He is truth. He is real. And because we acknowledge that, we must also acknowledge that, yeah, the devil is real. And so are his demons. So are the angels. You know, we can end up so focused on the bad that we forget that there's good. Where there's evil, there must be good. Light dispels darkness. And of course, the absent of light is darkness. You know, it can be scary to think about the demonic, but don't forget that the angelic host of God, of the King of Kings, that Jesus Christ exists as well. And the reality leads to the truth that all of this affects you and me in our everyday lives. Whether you realize it or not, it's not just some fantasy or fictional story that we see played out on screens or books before us. There is a realness to the darkness, and it's very real. And it's very easy for us to be distracted because of it. When I think of the absence of peace, it's just like this visual I want you to see right now. And what you're seeing is in this crowd, you see this moving, 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 moving with this pace that just keeps going. There's no rest. There's no stop, no connection with others, no time to process, no time, no time just to be still. It's just go, go, go. And to me, when I started thinking about this message, 
I started thinking about what was the best way for me to visualize the absence of peace. And for me, it was this. So if that's what it looks like to not have peace, what does it look like to have peace? Well, I think Jesus displayed that perfectly. You know, when chaos was going on all around him, he was always a stronghold of peace. And he was, I imagine, this, uh, this, this, next, this next visual I want you to see. Everything is going on around us. And I'm not saying this guy is Jesus that you're seeing, but it's a perfect picture of with all the craziness and the madness and the nonstop of the world goes by. Jesus is very still. And he's in the midst of it. He knows how not to get swept away with the current. He knows how to be where he needs to be to have peace. And he wants that for you. And he wants that for me. And, you know, even though there's a bunch of chaos going on around him and you're not necessarily seeing this oasis and this garden and this river and all that, just someone just sitting on a rock, like there's a great deal of understanding of peace by looking at this. Even though there's chaos all around him, because it's hard to have chaos when there's peace, right? And it's hard to have peace when there's chaos because to understand one, you have to understand the other. You would not understand peace. You would not understand the benefit of it if there wasn't chaos because that's how you would know, right? And, and so Jesus obviously, again, shows us so perfectly. And what we want to understand here today is how do we, how do you find this same peace? How did Jesus find it? You know, several times we read in scripture, he went off on his own. He got a way to pray to his father, God. And many times he went and just left the crowds to get to peace. He had to just get alone. And so we have to ask ourselves, what can we learn? How can we find peace? And why is it that we're even important enough to think about all this? So I think the question goes back to this idea of peace or torment. You know, even the demons recognize the authority of Jesus Christ. In Matthew 28, 17 through 19, we read, And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted, and Jesus came to them, and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have shown you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. <laughs> There's so much peace that comes in that passage, but... Here's what he's saying. Jesus is saying that all authority of heaven has been given to me. And now I'm telling you to go out and make disciples. That means to replicate yourself. Doing the things I've taught you, baptizing them, teaching them about me, teaching them all the things. And I want to come back to that part because that is so important. We know that Jesus had the authority given to him from heaven. And then he also said this in Luke chapter 10, verse 18 through 20. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I was there. You know, I've witnessed this. I've seen it. I am God. Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in the heavens. Did you know it's possible to have authority and display humility at the same time? It's true. There's a whole message in those three verses right there. But the reason why I'm telling you this is Jesus has already established right here that he has all the authority given to him. And now he is saying this, behold, I give you the same authority. Now, I understand he's talking to a select group of people at the time. And you have to ask yourself, well, he was giving a specific charge to them. What does that mean for me? What does that mean for us? Well, let's go back. To Matthew chapter 28, everyone there, everyone there are his disciples. And he is telling them to replicate themselves, to create more disciples, and that they will have his same authority. The same authority was given to Jesus will be given to those who call him Savior, who are sons and daughters of God. And, and then they are to go out and teach those. Well, guess what? Those who call Jesus Lord, maybe right, maybe that includes you today. Those who call or identify as Christian and say, yes, I've given myself completely to Jesus. He's the Lord of my life. He's forgiven me of my sins. He's my Savior. For those that can say that, guess what? If that's you, you are a byproduct of generations and generations and generations and generations, years and years and years and years of people making disciples and replicating themselves. And that all went back to this moment where Jesus began that process. So stand bold 
as a child of the king, as a son or daughter of God, you have authority as well. Now, why is that important? Well, let's move on to our passage today. Mark chapter 5, it says this, They arrived on the other side of the sea in the country of the Gerasians. As Jesus got out of the boat, a madman from the cemetery came up to him. He lived there among the tombs and the graves, and no one could restrain him. He could not stay chained. He could not be tied down. He'd been tied up many times with chains and ropes, but he just broke them. He snapped them. No one was strong enough to tame him night and day. He roamed through the graves and the hills, screaming out, lashing out himself with sharp stones. And when he saw Jesus a long way off, he ran and bowed and worshiped before him. And he howled in protest at the same time. What business do you have, Jesus, son of the high God, messing with me? I swear to God, don't give me a hard time. And Jesus had commanded the tormented evil spirit, out, get out of the man. Jesus asked him, tell me your name. He replied, my name is Legion. We are a rioting mob. Legion is the word that's used most often in scripture. And what, what is Legion? What does this matter? Why is his name Legion? Well, the way to describe that is it was considered a Roman army that comprised of two to 6,000 people. So Legion is saying, this is who I am. I am Legion. We are many. Then he desperately begged Jesus not to banish them from the country. There was a, a large herd of pigs that was grazing and rooting on a nearby hill since this was a Gentile area. And the demons begged him, send us to the pigs so we can live in them. And Jesus gave the order. But it was even worse for the pigs and for the man crazed. They stampeded over a cliff and into the sea and they drowned. Those tending the pigs, they were absolutely scared to death. They bolted and they told their story in the town and country. And everybody wanted to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and they saw the madman sitting there wearing decent clothes and, and making sense. No longer a walking madhouse of a man. Those who had seen it told the others what had happened to the demon-possessed man and pigs. At first, they were in awe. Wow, this is amazing. Even a miracle. And then they were upset. You can imagine the people who are attending the parties, you know, they're, they're upset for the drowned pigs. Their livelihood was just taken away from them. And regardless of the miracle that had just happened, they put themselves and their needs above it. And they demanded that Jesus leave and not come back. And as Jesus was getting in the boat, the demon-delivered man begged to go along. Jesus, take me with you. But Jesus wouldn't let him. He said, you need to go home to your own people and tell them your story. Tell them what the master did, how he had mercy on you. And the man, he went back and began to preach in, in, in 10 towns that surrounded that area. It was called the Decapolis area about what Jesus had done for them. And he really was. He was the talk of the town. And after Jesus crossed over by boat, a large crowd met him in the seaside. One of the meeting place uh, leaders named Jairus came. When he saw Jesus, he fell to his knees beside himself and he begged, My dear daughter is at death's door. Come, lay hands on her so she will get alive and well. And Jesus went along with him. The whole crowd tagged along, pushing and jostling him. We're not, we're not going to get into the rest of this chapter, but what I have to tell you is this. That one thing led to another, and one miracle led to another. And through this, Jesus' authority was established, and it led to another miracle. And this miracle that's coming up, this, this is a religious leader named Jairus, that his daughter was dying. And so he was considered a very important person, a very important leader. And it would be very important for Jesus to go take care of this need immediately. And along his way, he's interrupted by another person. We read later on in the book of Mark, a woman with the issue of blood. Now, now, this woman was not named. She was not important to culture. In fact, she was shunned because she had this issue and she had dealt with it for years. And Jesus actually stops to deal with this, what would be considered culturally unimportant situation before going on to what would be considered an important situation. And he heals her. In the meantime, though, the daughter of this important man, she dies. And time went on. She died. She didn't, Jesus didn't come when they wanted, and she wasn't able to be healed. But that's okay, because Jesus not only is the healer, he's the resurrector, right? And he goes and he resurrects her. But it's just, it, gets, it just goes to show that sometimes the priorities that we have in life, they're not God's priorities. He reorders our priorities. He reorders your priorities. And that can be very frustrating to you and me. That 
That could seem like an unfair decision. It brings confusion, maybe a little bit of trauma and torment into our lives when things don't go as we have planned. But God has a plan. He has a way. He is Jesus. He has the authority and all of it matters to him. It really does. You, you matter to him. You are important. You know why? Because Jesus is willing to move mountains for you. Jesus is willing to calm the storm for you. Oh, yes, Jesus is willing. This man that had been known uh, and the man, this man that was filled with a legion of demons, you know, another place in scripture says that when the demons are cast out of someone, they look for a place to reside. And they often go out into waterless places. They fear water. <laughs> That's right. I just said they fear water. Water itself torments them. So they go about wandering, looking where to reside in these waterless places. And you have to understand that when a demon is expelled, oftentimes in scripture, it talks about they will go and they will bring back more, more to torment, more to taunt, more to fill the empty void in that person and even stronger demonic forces. So you can imagine that this man, if he'd been filled with thousands and thousands of demons, how many times? How many times over and over he been delivered and refilled again, delivered, refilled, delivered, tormented, tormented, tormented. But as soon as Jesus steps in and fills that void in his heart, gives him a purpose. Wow. How that changes everything. He becomes an evangelist for Christ, going in and sharing and bringing all the people in, recognizing who Jesus is at the point where these other miracles start popping up. Another needs start presenting themselves, but to even get to the man who had been in torment for years and years and years and years, listen, this was important to Jesus. This wasn't just someone that Jesus happened upon. And I want to share with you something that was a first enlightenment to me as I was studying this, because at the end of Mark chapter four, where Noah explained Jesus was teaching on the sowers last week. We read this, that that same day. And now I'm going backwards, but you have to realize that the Bible wasn't written in chapters. We did that. Mark is telling this continuous story. And so the end of Mark chapter four leads into chapter five. But pretend like the divides aren't there. So that same day, same day, Jesus said to his disciples, verse 35, Let's cross over to the other side of the lake, leaving the crowd behind. The disciples got in the boat in which Jesus was already sitting, and they took him with them. Other boats sailed with them. Suddenly, as they were crossing the lake, a ferocious storm arose with violent winds and waves that were crashing into the boat, and it was nearly swamped. And Jesus, though, he was just calmly sleeping in the stern, resting on a cushion. So they shook him, saying, Teacher, do you not even care that we're about to die? <laughs> And fully awake, he rebuked the storm and shouted the sea, Hush! Be still! All at once, the wind stopped howling and the water became perfectly still. Then he turned to his disciples and said to them, Why are you so afraid? Haven't you learned to trust me yet? But they were. They were overwhelmed with fear and all, and said to each other, Who is this man who has such authority? There's that word again. Even the wind and waves obey him. Well, where were they going on the other side of that storm? They were going to this Gentile region, and Jesus was going directly toward this tormented man. Because we pick up in chapter 5 where he steps off the boat, and they encounter him. If you've ever been to Israel, it's amazing. I've, I've had the pleasure. I've been on the Sea of Galilee. It's massive. It's rare that you can actually see from one side to the other. If you're looking long ways on the sea, it's really hard. Like if you're up on the north side and you're looking down, that's why they call it a sea because it's just so massive but there are parts narrower parts where you can see the other side and i've been to this location where they suggest that this could be the gentile area garcia and while there it's amazing because jesus used the lake so many times as a teaching spot because you can be speaking on one side and here on the other and even still when you're standing with the sea behind you and people sat on the hillside which is what often happened you know kind of like a natural amphitheater the sea helped to reverberate and to magnify what was being said and broadcast it to many people. So it's not out of the question to think that the cries of this man on one side of the lake could have been heard on the other. And Jesus responded. I mean, it's a little bit of a Joshism. <laughs> That's me inserting my assumption in the story. But 
he went through it and the storm came to stop him. Now, anytime Jesus rebukes something, he's not rebuking himself. He's not rebuking his own will. So it's not like Jesus caused the storm. He's not going to rebuke his own self. He came against something. There was an attack. And I would venture to say that the storm was brought on to keep and distract them from going to the other side. But Jesus stopped it. He went through that storm knowing that this man was on the other side, this man in torment for years and years and years and years. And just like him, he's going to go through the storm for you. He will. Whatever demon you're facing, whatever torment you're facing, you can choose peace. And God wants to give it to you today. And if we're going to talk about peace, we got to talk about where to find it. Well, you find it with your time with God through worship, prayer, reading God's word. I know it can sound so cliche, but it's so true. When you surround yourself with the things of God, you will find more peace in your life. Not that the storm and the crowds and all that seems chaotic won't affect you and won't be passing by, but you have peace in the middle of it all. Through Jesus Christ, you know, there, there's another place to find peace when you're here. Time with the church, worshiping again. Worship is so important that when we worship God, things happen. Things happen in the spiritual realm. It does because God's word doesn't return void and there's power in his word. There's power in his name. He is authority and he's given that authority through us, through serving, through growing together. You know, here at the point we're going to be starting this initiative this fall of, of launching our grow groups and being relaunching rather and being a part of a, a group that can share life together, share struggles together, share peace together is so important. God speaks to his people. He does. And, and that's a great way of surrounding yourself. A great way to find peace is to surround yourself with other like minded believers that are on the same journey, on the same path as you. So don't discount that. Don't discount serving. Don't discount worshiping. Don't discount your time of just speaking to God and reading his word. Don't discount time spending together. I mean, if you're not in a grow group, we don't want you to be demon possessed. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That was, that was a little extreme. But these things, they will bring you peace. You know, it's very clear that in Philippians, we, we read this. We read that the peace of God surpasses all understanding. Philippians 4, 7. So guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Another version says this, God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will guard your heart and mind through Jesus. And I love this paraphrase in the message. It says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let your petitions, let your praises shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns before you know it. A sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. And this is so true. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in my own life, uh, our own lives and our family. Absolutely. We know the enemy's intention. We know the enemy's intention is to prowl around like a roaring lion. First Peter 5, 8 through 11 says, looking for someone to devour, resist him. Standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you. He'll make you strong, firm, and steadfast. So because of that, to him be the power forever and ever. We know that the intent of the enemy is to bring you down. We know that the intent of the enemy is to distract you. It is to torment you. But they also, like Legion and this man, knew that Jesus was there. They knew his authority. They knew that he could have the power to dispel them. And they even asked, are you here to torment us early? Because we know in Revelation that the devil, the beast, all that follow him and all who do not submit to God through Jesus will be cast in a lake of fire and tormented forever. They know that's coming. And they recognize this authority and say, are you here to torment us? Sir, please, please, please don't just cast us out in the abyss. Just send us into these pigs over here. Just send us into them at least. And, you know, Jesus wasn't going to let them just wander around and go into someone else. He sent them into the pigs, knowing full well the pigs were going to run into the sea. And yet they were tormented after all. Jesus loves you. He cares about you. He comes to the storms to minister to you. You know, I can't ever say that I've come and fought against a physical demon in my life, but I know, I know I've experienced spiritual darkness. 
I know. Maybe you're thinking, well, I've never experienced this. I, I think you have and you just don't realize it. Last Sunday, Caleb and I were riding home together in my car, just the two of us, and, and he just looked at me. And out of nowhere, I mean, it was silent. It really was. It was like he was processing. His wheels are turning, and he just simply out of nowhere just turns to me and says, Hey, Dad, you know, I'm like super afraid of the dark. I mean, it's a bright day. We were driving home from church, had a great day. We're heading home, and he talks about being afraid of that. Like, where did that come from? And I asked him, I said, well, why are you afraid of the dark? And he said, you know, I, I just, I'm afraid of the monsters. So why do you think there are monsters? He said, I don't know. I just think there are. And I said, well, let me encourage you with this. Your dad used to be afraid of the dark for a long time, for a long time. Because adults in the room, <laughs> we all know. We all know when the lights go off in our bedroom, there, there's nothing that's just magically going to appear to hurt us. Then why do so many of us fear the darkness? It's because we know there's another layer there. There's another layer, right, that, that exists. Things we cannot see and without the peace of God in our lives that can torment us, even in the dark. And we obviously can connect darkness to spiritual darkness. I, I told him, I said, Caleb, let me assure you, there are no physical monsters in our home. I will not let anybody with evil intent to harm you in our home. And there's nothing spiritually that's going to harm you either. There are no spiritual monsters in our home because we have the authority in Jesus' name to cast out all fear. And it was an interesting and amazing conversation to have with a six-year-old. <laughs> and before we went on to talk about slime and when Paw Patrol Live was going to come back to town, he, he stopped and told me, Dad, I'm glad you were my dad and that you are so strong. Okay. And this brings me to another story. I, I guess it was a year or two ago, our oldest daughter, Bree, and, and I have permission to share this from her. She, she went through a very scary episode in her home where she woke up in the middle of the night. She knew something was scary and it really frightened her. She knew she saw something and it, and it scared her. And it was, she described it as a shadowy figure who was speaking all kinds of hate and vileness and fear. And she wasn't herself. We, we've never seen her like this before. She was rocking back and forth in her bed. We, we brought her to our room. She wasn't making sense with what she was saying, but we could tell she was very frightened. And Deanna and I, we just stopped and we're like, okay, we really truly believe this is a spiritual attack right now. And this is not a thing of fiction. This isn't something from a movie. This is happening. It's happening right now. And this room, this bedroom that we're in, and it's like our spiritual instincts took over. And I knew immediately, number one, get praying people involved. So I immediately called Pastor Rick and, and I say, here's what's going on. And he didn't doubt it for a second. He didn't question me. He didn't say, well, this is probably just anxiety or mental or, or depression. No, he's like, yeah, I believe this could be a spiritual as well. I'll start praying immediately. Deanna, I believe, I could be mistaken. I believe she called Todd. Todd had experienced a spiritual attack in El Salvador once and he was familiar with it, understood it, believed it would be, and he was praying for it. And at the same time, I just knew that she needed to be in a receiving and open position because she was still balled up and she was hysterical, just crying and so scared, frightened. And I remember my instinct was just to lay her back on our bedroom floor, like, you know, try to get her in a laying position. So I just prayed over her and I placed my hand over her head and I just prayed her all the way down, just giving glory to God that victory belongs in Jesus and the, and the devil, the enemy, his demons, they have no place here in the power of Jesus name leave stop attacking and you know we laid her down her head uh, and i asked our next assistant alexa i was like alexa play some worship music and she did she started playing some worship music and over the next few minutes you could see just all the chaos and all the torment and all that just melt away and that peace that god talks about just flooded our room entered into her and her words started becoming more understandable the crying faded away. She became more peaceful and matter of fact. And I will just never, ever forget that moment. I'll never forget what God did through that moment. You know, there was a storm that was attacking her and it was putting bad thoughts in her head, filling her with violent and evil thoughts and affecting her and scaring her. And yet Jesus is bigger than all of it. God was bigger than all that. Now, now that is just one way of understanding that the enemy exists, that demons are here to torment. They know their end, and they want to take you down. They don't want anyone else to survive, so that's what they do. That is what they do. And then Jesus is over here on the other side saying, but if you belong to me, the authority that's in me 
is in you. Go, get out. Light dispels darkness. So my question is, torment, just as demons ask, do you want it now? Do you want it later? I mean, there really needs to be an answer here because without Jesus, none of this matters. There is no peace. There's not going to be any peace for you if you're looking for peace in your life and you don't know Jesus. Jesus isn't a part of your life. Why would you have peace? Peace comes through the Prince of Peace, who is Jesus, and he will fight through anything for you. And you don't want the torment now or later, being separated by God for eternity. So peace is the answer. Peace is now. Choose peace. Find it in the things that we talked about. Understand the authority that's been given to you by God and realize that the enemy is real. And our story is just one of many. There are people around the world who have experienced very physical iterations of demonic activity. It's extremely real. You may say, well, why don't I notice? I don't know. I can't tell you. One thing I've learned through video games is that if you're facing enemies, you're going in the right direction. I mean, honestly, in a, in a game, if you've already cleared an area and you're just hanging out in that area, you're not going to face any challenges. But if you're going the right way in the game, you're going to face a boss, right? You're going to face an enemy. You're going to face people to fight along the way. And that's, that's why. And that's the way it is with our own lives as spiritual beings, as people who God has called to him. And we've answered that call. We're going to face. We're going to face trials. We're going to face the enemy on our way. And if if you're not and you're still hanging out in that area that's been cleared, I encourage you, the victory is down there. And no, it's not always fun to go through the middle part, but if God and Jesus is your Prince of Peace, God, you're going to come out on the other side stronger than ever. And you're going to be able to help others get through their torment. And you're going to know it that when that torment comes how to find peace. And you will appreciate God's peace so much more than you ever could have before. Listen, sometimes in these moments, Maybe you're in a storm right now. Maybe you're going through that storm or you're going through torment and you just want to escape. You just need to, you just need to get out. You just need to escape the situation of the pain or the trial. You know, God says, I'm going to give you something better than your fear. Don't bail. Don't bail on me. Don't bail on your situation. Don't bail on life itself because the torment is so great. Jesus is saying, you are so important to me. The man that Legion inhabited, who wasn't even living with the people, he, he became the first missionary to them. He was the first one of those Gentiles. So some of you are going to be the first. You're going to be the first to break the chain. None of your friends have done it. Not even your family did it. Nobody around you believes you can do it. And you didn't even believe it in yourself. But in this moment, because now I know who I am, I thought I was worthless Maybe you've believed that for years, but now I know who I am. Jesus came through all that for you, for me. He came through all that. And now I know who I am. Would you say that? Now I know who I am. The enemy only attacks what is valuable to God. Be the first to rise up. Break the chains. Break the chains. Don't let them hold you down. Know that you're worth it. Know you're important enough for Jesus to move through the storm to get to you. And then you have the same authority as him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this book of Mark. Thank you for the Mark's just heart to display your, your authority throughout his whole book. And just thank you for this little piece of like, there's so many things, so many important things that Mark can include in his entire book. And I'm sure there was a lot that had to be left on the cutting room floor. And like, how can you do that? Like when it comes to you, God, like, how in the world can you choose what goes in or what doesn't? But he made sure to put this story of this man who was inhabited by legion and what God did, what Jesus did, how he showed his authority. There was a reason for it. And so today, I just pray that you help that reason be so clear to any of us as we face torment, as we seek peace, God, help us to really, truly understand that comes from you. And yes, we may know that. God, help us to not just know it, but believe it and act on it. And Lord, as we, we come through those uh, this torment that we may be going through or will go through, Lord, that, that you will be victorious, that you will get all the glory, that when we come the other side, we'll go back and we'll share it to people what you've done and that they will turn to you as well. And they will come seek you for their peace. 
Thank you, God, that you were willing to walk through anything for us. We love you and we submit to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey there. Thank you so much for watching and checking us out. Hey, I want you to know we go live every Sunday, 9, 10, 15, and 11, 30. So I would love for you to like and subscribe to make sure that we can stay connected together all the time. I'll see you next time. Bye.